Mm, welcome everybody. I think it's already 6 p.m. but maybe we'll wait for five minutes more before we start just to ensure that if anybody is late we can wait for them.
So, good. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can see me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, mm. Sorry, I just can't understand why. Okay, so good evening, everybody. My name is Alex. I am the president of Quantum Information Society in this year. And let me say a few words before, a few greeting words before we start. Uh, this is our first event in the Trinity term, and we have actually quite a few events in the Trinity term. Among them, already familiar quantum coding workshop where you can get a hands-on experience on how to code a quantum computer, the one from IBM with their package Kiss Kit. And uh, we'd also have four talks with uh, really great speakers. The first one will be by Chiara Morletto about quantum gravity. Uh, the second will be by Professor Aspur Guzik from the University of Toronto. And uh, he's researching how to use quantum computers for quantum chemistry. And me and our events officer, Gide Minas, we were really pleased to know that he's gonna talk for us because we're working in the related area and we know how good he is. Uh, I can't believe myself, but the third talk or the third question and answer sessions will be by almighty Scott Aronson. And if you're interested in quantum information or quantum computing and you don't know who is Scott Aronson, it's, it's a little bit shame on you. He's the guy, for example, who proposed an experiment for Google's quantum supremacy. And he also has a really nice blog on quantum computing. You should definitely check this out. And the latest news are that Professor Christopher Monroe from the University of Maryland. Uh, he will give a talk to us. We haven't added this to our Tom card yet. And he's one of the biggest names in the trapped iron quantum computing. And maybe our second speaker, Ryan, can tell us a few words about this, uh, how great. I think he's great, but maybe like Ryan has other opinion, how great that Chris Monroe is. We also have started a weekly challenge problem where we post a challenge, a problem each week in our Facebook group and uh, you send us our solutions and you can win a book on quantum information. And I think it's really cool because problems are not that hard and the books are cool. And I'm surprised why nobody has sent us a solution yet. So we have time until Friday, hurry up guys. And we have one more type of events, which I ask you to pay your attention to. These are journal clubs where we'll gather and go through the most recent and the most thought-provoking papers in quantum theory, quantum information, quantum computing. And all the previous events are kind of events when you come and you listen to somebody. These are events when you come and you listen, it's good, but the most important, you talk, you discuss something, you argue, you can even shout whatever makes you happy. Why I think it is important? Because like, you know, we don't have scalable quantum computer and we don't have a consistent theory of quantum gravity, it means that uh, we have still much more questions than we have answers. And in my opinion, the only way to get new answers is to discuss the ideas with people and not sitting by yourself in some dark room as we are doing right now. And to my surprise, the quarantine only helps us now because we understood that uh, even though our society is called Oxford Quantum uh, Information Society, the Oxford in the name doesn't mean the place where we should stay forever. It's just the play where, place where we were born. And I know that already we have some attendees from outside Oxford, from uh, London, from Calgary, if I'm not mistaken, even from MIT. And my personal plea, my beg you all, talk to us, talk to other people, uh, send us messages, tell others about confirmation about our society, uh, propose crazy ideas, propose some crazy events. We're absolutely happy to support any initiative because like confirmation society, it's not eight a week, eight events per term. It's just the people who are talk together. It's the communication and it's the way you try to live your life each day. So if anybody has heard me, because it was kind of strange experience talking to the silence, uh, I don't know, we have questions and answer sections on Zoom, which you can ask, uh, which you can use later during the flash talks. And maybe some of them can send me some like plus that we listen to you and you're still here. Or maybe speakers can give some notice to me, I don't know. So let's proceed to flash talks.
I want to thank the previous committee who handed over this event to us. They already made some preparations. And the first speaker is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, my first language is Russian, so I can be absolutely terrible in pronunciation of all these names. The first speaker is Augustine Banriet Velde. Uh, a few words about him. He's a PhD student in physics, both at Imperial College London at University of Oxford. And he's working on indefinite causal orders and foundations of quantum theory in quantum, uh, sorry, quantum group department of computer science. And what he's gonna talk, so he's gonna talk about, he's gonna tell us about some usual misconceptions in quantum theory we have. And I already see one misconception. I don't understand how you can do a PhD in physics in the department of computer science. So maybe he will tell this to us. So Agustin, you're welcome to turn on your video, to turn your, uh, uh, turn your mic. I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm absolutely new to this Zoom sync and I, uh, yeah. Hello, um, I think you can hear me, but, uh, oh yeah. All right, yeah, so here okay. is Agustin. Okay, here we are. Uh, let me, I, I, yeah, let me uh, disappear. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alexei, for your presentation. For Thank you to everyone in the Quantum Information Society for inviting me. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to share my screen before anything else. There you go. Can you confirm me that everybody's seeing my screen right now? I can see your screen. Great. Uh, so yeah, just to answer your question, uh, the main answer of to why why uh, physicists are right are in computer science right now is because of funding. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you very much, Alexei, for your presentation. So this talk indeed uh, we will not necessarily be directly related to my to my work as a PhD student. Uh, my work is really related to, to what Clay is going to talk to you about a bit later. Uh, it's it's rather a general talk, uh, rather about actually what how how quantum theory should be introduced to people, either to the general public or to or to undergrads. Uh, so the the general framework of the of this talk is around the question of what is quantum theory and what it is, what is it about? So what do I mean by this question? I mean the idea that uh, physical theories or scientific theories in general should have conceptual lessons. They should tell you something about the world, something that of course has to be stated in, in very rigorous terms for, for the people who know it, but who could, things that could also be spread to the world in kind of, of a few sentences that, that really tell you uh, what, what this is telling us about the world. Uh, so as an aside to kind of liven up this talk, all the pictures in this talk, are, um, I found them by looking up quantum in Google images and taking the worst images I could find. And everybody knows that when quantum things are involved, there are lots of terrible images. So, so for example, this image can, maybe tell you what, what quantum theory is about. It's apparently about waves. It's about lots, really a swarm of particles going around in a very intricate way. It's probably about stars in the background. And I think it's about a black hole in the middle of the picture. Uh, so more seriously, to, to, to know where I'm going to, we, we have to know where, where quantum theory comes from in terms of, of, this, of these characterizations of it. So what we have to remember is that quantum theory has a history. It has been developed specifically in a, in a very specific uh, time where people were asking specific questions. And those specific questions were about a specific field that is atomic mechanics. And, and atomic mechanics happens to be the first field in which people have stumbled upon the quantum world. So, so the first field in which they have had to describe quantum theory. And naturally this led to quantum theory having to be described in terms of mechanical complex. And, and as, uh, sorry, um, so, so that's how quantum theory has been first developed and, and now it happens that a century later, these mechanical concepts are still around and they are still presented as fundamental if you open your, pretty much any, any outreach book or any introductory textbook to quantum theory, uh, you will be introduced to those mechanical concepts which I will elaborate on shortly. But 
uh, especially from quantum information perspective, it appears that some of these concepts, not all of them, but some of them, uh, are at best a first order approximation of what is really at stake. And in particular, they lead to this confusion precisely between what is mechanical in nature and what is quantum in nature. Uh, and, and quantum information theory shows that you can get rid of the, of the mechanical. And that's what we are going to try right now, to try to get, get rid of the mechanical, get rid of this mechanical envelope that really obfuscates lots, lots of uh, genuinely quantum features and, and to, to go to the core, to go to the, really to the bare bones of quantum theory. Uh, so let me first elaborate on this idea of mechanics, and, and that will be kind of the first misconception uh, I'm going to talk about, which is that we should be this idea that uh, this name of quantum mechanics. I mean, of course, quantum mechanics is important, but it's, it should just be a subfield of, of what quantum theory is about. The mechanics is the study of motion, and once again, the study of motion is the first area of physics in which the quantum world has been reached. But since then, uh, lots of other areas of physics have reached the quantum regime. And by reaching the quantum regime, what we mean is something about basically the structure of the state space, the structure of the evolution, the structure of the observables. That's something that you could call quantum information theory if you want. I think it's even deeper than that probably, and that's what I call quantum theory. And this is what is truly quantum. Uh, there, is, there is also a side point uh, about, about, this, uh, about this emphasis on quantum mechanics. So, so you see that the emphasis on mechanics is, is not necessary. And also there's the fact that the systems in, in mechanics usually are infinite dimensional, which is, I mean, for, for those of you who don't know what that means, it basically means they are very intricate. They, they, they have lots of freedom. They, they are difficult things to, to, to describe. And this, this infinite dimensionality obfuscates the conceptual nature of many quantum features, which you can actually see way more clearly in, in, and more manageably in finite dimensional examples, such as uh, the, the well-known, I suppose, qubit. Uh, and in the qubit, you can see lots of things that are generally quantum and, and which, which do not need any atom to see. So, so really to emphasize my point, my point here is that quantum mechanics is just this theory that you get when you start with quantum theory, the general theory about how states, what kind of states can exist, what can you say about those states. And within this framework, you try to write a theory of mechanics. But we have, but as, as uh, even though historically it, quantum mechanics has appeared first, we have to, if we want to, to understand what the, what the theory is about, we, we have to focus on quantum theory uh, and not the other way around. Let me emphasize, of course, uh, that uh, quantum mechanics is extremely important it is in, in its own right. All, all I'm trying to say is that is that it is better if we if we realize uh, what what is at the what is at the core of, of, of the quantum of the quantum world. So let me let me now uh, elaborate on some of those misconceptions that have arisen because of because of the mechanical focus on, on quantum theory. Uh, the first one is a very well-known uncertainty principle, uh, which I've put, as you can see, under scare quotes, uh, because it's not about uncertainty and it's not principle. Uh, so I have stated it below in a voluntarily and in a purposefully uh, misleading way, uh, but but a way that is quite close to things you could read in, in journals when they talk, in in newspapers. I mean, when they talk about the, the, the uncertainty principle, whatever they do, uh, it's impossible to both know about both position and momentum. Uh, as, as lots of people already know, I suppose, it, it, is, it is very misleading, and the, the misleading part is already in the name, in the name uncertainty. Uh, the name uncertainty really makes you believe that there are quantities out there, there is a particle's position, there is a particle's momentum, but the universe is scheming in a way such that we cannot access them, and such that when we try to access the position, we are messing up the momentum, so, so, so we, 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 haven't, we have lost track of the momentum. But this is not what, I mean, if you take quantum theory seriously, this is not what it says. It says that those quantities are not definite in the first place. So there's nothing to be uncertain about. So it's not about uncertainty, it's about indeterminacy. And that's actually, in fact, the word that Heisenberg himself used in, in Germany, he used the word Unbestimtheit, which, was, which means indeterminacy in English and was only translated as uncertainty. 
Moreover, uh, the uncertainty principle is often called a principle and therefore often seen as, as kind of the basis of, of what, what quantum mechanics and quantum theory are. But even within the realm of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle is not a principle. It is merely a theorem that you can derive from deeper and more structural principles. And so, so, so it has kind of a, a fundamental tune to it that is not necessary. Uh, as a side point, it usually also comes with a, a, an inappropriate observer effect interpretation uh, that was the, the original interpretation of Heisenberg that has been proven wrong since. Uh, but, but finally, uh, and finally, it puts this emphasis on position and momentum or energy and time or other, uh, or other dual quantities when, in fact, it, there is nothing specific about position and momentum in quantum theory. It says nothing specific about mechanical uh, quantities. Um, and this is a bit the same thing with wave particle duality, my second example, which again, in a purposefully misleading way, I state like this particles have wave like and particle like properties, and both cannot be brought together. Uh, this was very central, for example, to the thinking of, of Niels Bohr. Um, and, and once again, this has, in the context, it was, it was very, much, uh, very much suitable. Because the context was that uh, where was a context when diffraction experiments had been very paradigmatic to any thinking about this, and people were really focusing on particles and on, on their behavior. So, despite its historical value, uh, anything you can see in, in a double slit experiment, um, it, it, there's nothing fundamental to it, it, especially anything you can see in a double slit experiment, you can see in a qubit. Uh, and, and double slit experiments are just a realization amongst millions of uh, qubit, really. And so, so this all, this gives the, the, the very misleading interpretation that quantum theory, once again, is about well, this lesson that we, that we should give, that the general public maybe should give from, from uh, quantum theory, is that, you know, it's about the fact that particle, particles are also waves or this kind of thing. And, and Particles being also waves is just something that appears once again when you try to write mechanics within quantum theory. But but there are core principles of quantum theory that are below this and that explain this. And once again, in general, quantum theory is not even about the motion of particles anyway. And finally, as I've criticized the word mechanics mechanics in quantum mechanics, I'm now going to criticize the word quantum in quantum mechanics. What does quantum mean in the beginning? It means, of course, this discrete character. And once again, uh, to be fair, historically, the discrete character has been our first clue towards discovering the quantum world. So, so of course, this makes sense. But we still have to, to realize that uh, even though the discretization is indeed usually associated with the classical quantum transition, so it's kind of a clue towards quantum behavior, this is not fundamental. This is once again the consequence of trying to write some dynamics with specific uh, constraints within a quantum theory. Uh, and, and it is very misleading in the fact that it is actually kind of contrary to, to the actual lesson of quantum theory. The actual lesson of quantum theory is actually to see that when you apply it, for example, to a, to a discrete system, then the system, a uh, system that classically is discrete, then the system actually becomes in some specific way continuous, that the state space becomes continuous. So, in fact, quantum theory, it is way more fruitful to see it. Of course, this, this would need to be precised further, but, but just to state it broadly, it is way more fruitful to consider it as demonstrating continuity in nature rather than, uh, rather than uh, discreteness. So um, what is actually quantum about? Uh, we don't know. I think that it's fair to say that there is absolutely no consensus within the fantasy community what, uh, about what it is about. I think there are very important, important and interesting things to say uh, within the framework of, of, of quantum information theory. Uh, but at least I think it's important. I mean, the problem is sufficiently hard so that we can at least put aside what it is not about. And I think uh, you've gotten at this point that my point is this is not about mechanics. And, and to understand what it is about, we have to focus on this structure, of the, on this abstract structure of the state space, uh, in which you don't have, you shouldn't have to mention the nature of the degrees of freedom. And then you can, on the top of it, add the names of degrees of freedom and, and add some dynamics, for example, on top of it, some physics. 
Um, and for example, to just give you an idea of what could the quantum world be about, uh, in the, in the past decade, there has been some, uh, in my opinion, considerable progress in this direction, especially through the uh, through several informational axiomatizations of quantum theory that have been developed. So axiomatizations that take that take as axioms, purely uh, informational axioms that constrain what we can say about states, how we can prove states, how we can purify states, and so on. And from purely from these axioms, within a very general framework, you can single out quantum theory. Uh, and finally, my point is, once again, it, it, I find it too bad that still again in several uh, pop science books or in, out or in textbooks that are published today, the general public is made to think that quantum theory is about, uh, is about things being wave and particle, being waves and particles at the same time and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's time to that that the general public can, of course, in a suitable way, be told about this revolution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Augustine. Uh, so, as in usual talks, there is a question and answers time, and the oh, Jesus Christ! So we already have one question in the question and answer sessions. Augustine can read it and answer it. And also to all the attendees who are not speakers, you can raise a hand. There is such an action in Zoom. And it means that we'll be able to, um, how to say this, to turn on your mic and you'll be able to ask your question in voice if you want to. Or you can just send this question to the questions and answers by text, with text. So Augustine, there is a question. If you stripped all the mechanics away, then isn't quantum theory just a linear algebra? Yeah, thank you, anonymous attendee, for this question. Uh, this this is an interesting question. I mean, uh, and I think the answer the answer is no. Uh, in quantum information theory, this is not just linear algebra. You have a, quite a good deal of physical interpretation on top of it, and the physical interpretation will be about what is an observable, will be about uh, how the states can evolve, what are the what are the evolutions. There there are there will be quantities, for example, like entanglement. That of course uh, you can you can characterize mathematically through linear algebra, but which have also a physical meaning, physical meaning, for example, in terms of what you can do with it, of in terms of can you transmit information with it, in terms of, for example, dense coding, all of this uh, will be far beyond pure math. This is not pure math, it has a physical interpretation uh, um, attached to it. Any other questions? You can raise your hands, I think. Yeah, can you? yeah. Uh, but I also have a question myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard from somebody, but I don't remember from whom. So like in uh, what you're talking about in the modern quantum physics textbooks, they start from the Hilbert space postulate and this kind of stuff. Like so that the state is a vector in Hilbert space and it, it can, and any Hilbert space vector is a valid state. I have a question. Have you heard anything of um, starting quantum mechanics without Hilbert space? With some, I don't know, like um, in, in other that, axioms. Well, as a, as a first answer, uh, nothing I'm saying is against Hilbert spaces. I think Hilbert spaces are, are far more, uh, I mean, the, the issue with Hilbert spaces is that they are completely abstract in the sense that they really don't make sense. I mean, they, they, they are purely mathematical objects. Uh, but, but Hilbert spaces by themselves, all, all the work that von Neumann had done in, in terms of uh, giving a mathematical formalism, a general one to, to quantum mechanics, uh, I think, I think it, it certainly doesn't come under my criticism here, because it, it does not make uh, any reference to, to mechanical, uh, to, to mechanical uh, quantities. So, so, so really, I, I see, I see no issue with uh, with with the mention uh, mentioning uh, Hilbert spaces and, and this kind of mathematical formalism. But to answer your question, uh, there are also other uh, formalisms, of course, equivalent ones that have been developed uh, recently, and especially in the quantum group. Actually, people are working on on a formalism that kind of, of course, in the end, recovers Hilbert spaces, but from kind of a very different perspective, and that is called the perspective of process theory. Uh, built on, a, on mathematical theories uh, called category theory. Um, I don't think I have time to expand on that, but actually there are uh, there are also uh, 
uh, people are also working in those directions. Yeah, and uh, to be to be honest, uh, I mean, I kind of I'm kind of defending my own field, but I think that the results are pretty uh, extraordinary. Okay, uh, we have Probably three other we have three other questions, and I think we'll maybe uh, uh, stop after them because we have some kind of time limit. Okay. Uh, can can everyone see the questions? Uh, Shall I read them, maybe. Yeah, read. Okay, so the, the question of Jan Oler Ernst: How can you reconcile the wave function evolving in n-dimensional phase space and particles evolving in real physical space, presumably three-dimensional, which presumably underlie the experiments we do to verify experimental quantum prediction? Is there nothing like a physical ontology? So I think, um, thank you for your question. I think what you, what you, what you are saying is that um, how, how can I, I mean, in the end, in the end, my, if I do not have any physical interpretation for it, my, my, my state is, is kind of a very general generic function. In a, in a very general space, and now how can I connect it to real physical space? Um, well, I think anyway. In the in the end, um, in the end, there is this physical ontology you're talking about. Uh, you just have to add it on top. Uh, sorry, maybe my, my answer is a bit is a bit blurry. Um, I think um, I, I think quantum theory comes before the existence of real physical space. Uh, it is it is a theory about the general possible knowledge. Now there is absolutely nothing that prevents you, and of course you should do it when you're working with mechanical quantities to, to write it into a three-dimensional space or whichever space you want. Uh, and by the way, lots of things that are happening in three-dimensional space will be described by non-three-dimensional systems like, uh, you know, quantum field theory or your configuration space is absolutely huge, uh, even though the, the, the space, the physical space is three-dimensional. Uh, but, but anyway, I'd say that, um, yeah, I, I'd say that there, there, is no, there is no issue with, uh, in, in, it is in fact even more general to start with uh, quantum with quantum theory in general spaces, and then if you want to apply it to a specific expression like mechanics, you can apply it to a physical space. Uh, can you briefly answer these two questions? Yeah, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, so Anonymous Attendee asks, do you think another application of quantum theory, such as quantum optics, would be a better starting point to explain quantum theory than quantum mechanics? Um, well, I, I think it would still miss the point if we if we change to one physical prejudice for another, if we, if we switch to another physical prejudice like quantum optics could, could be. Uh, there, there are reasons why you could, you could feel like at least quantum optics is a bit neater than, than quantum theory, than quantum mechanics, uh, because basically because it has less degrees of freedom. Um, so, so, and for example, the working with a um, polarization or or this kind of this kind of quantities which are finite dimensional, I'd say I'd say this has more chances of giving giving a, a right and simple simple example, for example, of a quantum quantum theoretical degree of freedom. So so I, I think I think this could be maybe better suited, but in the end, the, the real point should be we, we should abstract away from any any particular physical realization. And finally, uh, well, there, there's still another one. So, so to answer Jonas from Tkalza, what do you mean by quantum pro properties are a priori indeterminate? What, what I'm trying to say is that just the simple fact that when you're, when you're talking about a physical quantity and your quantum state is not in an eigenstate of this quantity, of the, of the corresponding observable, then, so, so just to say, to say it in non-technical term, when it's in a quantum superposition with relation to this particular observable, then there, there is absolutely no meaning to give to you know the value of this observable. There is no value. I mean, at least if you take quantum theory seriously, or you don't believe in it, and then you believe in, in hidden in hidden variables. But if you take quantum theory seriously, 
uh, th there is no position of the particle that we cannot access. The, the particle has no position. This quantity makes no physical sense. This quantity can only make physical sense within a very specific uh, framework that you in a very specific situation that you have to create. Okay, I'll try maybe to answer very quickly. Maybe we'll then. maybe we'll postpone this question to the end of. Okay, uh, okay if you don't mind. If, if, if okay, I know one should. I can answer him. Uh, I can answer him myself. Yeah, or you can write just uh, to him, like you can write. Okay, Great. so let's proceed to the second talk. Thank you very much um, for your. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Agustin. Like, yeah. Uh, the second speaker is, uh, let me, I think I should do some manipulations to allow him to show his screens. The second speaker is uh, Ryan Henley. He's a postdoc working in the Oxford Iron Trap, um, uh, in Oxford Iron Trap Research Group. And in particular, his research topic is uh, microwave driven quantum computing with trapped ions. And that's, and he gonna tell us about his research. I am, if I can get my... Uh... <laughs> PowerPoint has just crashed. It's a bad time to crash. PowerPoint? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm old school. Stop it. <laughs> All right, so. Sorry. No worries. Thanks for joining us. That's all right. Looks like you have two screens. I do, yeah, sorry. Let me... It's all just died on me. Right. Sorry about this. I mean, if you want, we can uh, ask Claire to give a talk. If you need some more time. Uh, two seconds, maybe then. All right. Uh, right. Will that work? Yes, that was work. Okay, Good. great. So if I share my screen, does this work? Oh yeah. Yes. That's it. Oh yeah, I know this picture. Okay, so it's uh, Ryan. You're 15 minutes. You're welcome. Cool. So um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, like Alexi said, I'm Ryan, um, and I'm a postdoc in the Iron Trap Quantum Computing Group. Um, so my talk's going to be a bit less uh, controversial than, than the previous talk, and I'm going to try to convince you that uh, using trapped uh, ions is a, is a way forward to actually try and build a quantum computer. So this is a picture which is taken from uh, my lab uh, by one of our PhD students. So this is actually just taken with a DSLR camera with a very long exposure time. And if you look at right, can you see my mouse on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. So if you see right in the middle here, there's a little purple dot. That's actually a single strontium atom, which is trapped in this power trap. Um, so, and there's a sort of length scale here of a centimeter to give you an idea of the size. Um, so yeah, so we'll just move on. Yes, cool. So um, what I work on in particular is uh, microwave driven quantum computing with trapped ions, but I'm just gonna give you an overview of how you can use ions uh, to try and build a, a, a quantum computer. So first of all, there's many, many types of possible platforms for building a, a real life quantum computer. Um, so one of the leaders out there is superconducting circuits. So there's now companies involved in this, you know, the likes of Google um, and IBM. And these typically operate at dilution fridge temperatures. So all the things in blue here are typically a few millikelvin cryogenically cooled systems. There's a new field of semiconductor qubits coming out and also people using NV centers in diamond. Uh, and then more room temperature or sort of flow cryostat temperatures. So this is you know, of the order of five Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. You have optical systems, uh, which use lots of single photon sources and beam splitters. 
and then there's uh, iron traps, uh, which can operate at both room temperature and cryogenic temperatures also. So I'm going to talk about iron traps because that's what I do day in and day out. So this is a kind of talk outline. So I'll first kind of put you, you know, where we are at the moment in terms of the history of quantum computing and especially in terms of all these other like realizable platforms. And then I'll talk about, you know, wh where's the state of the art. Uh, and then I'll show you how we actually trap ions and then how do we go about performing you know, log quantum log logic operations on these ions. And then finally, I'll briefly talk about how we actually go about scaling these systems. To, so we actually have a realizable many, many qubit quantum processor. So the idea of a sort of quantum gate binary uh, quantum computer started with uh, David Deutsch uh, back in the 80s. Uh, and then after this proposal, there's a few theoretical breakthroughs, uh, one of which is uh, Shaw's algorithm. Um, and then Andrew Steen and Shaw also came up with the idea of doing quantum error correction. And then Sirach and Zoller propose a way of encoding all of this quantum information from the processing inside an iron trap. And then post that, NIST was the first to, so NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in America, were the first to demonstrate uh, quantum computing with an iron trap. And so you can see, so this is uh, the, basically the fidelity of the gate going down. So the, the lower you are on this graph, the better the gate. And this is year. So this is kind of like a quantum version of Moore's law. Um, and so ions have made uh, good progress over the last 20 years. And then so superconducting uh, circuits have also started to creep up on the ions as well. And then the silicon quantum dot people have arrived here. Now, there's multiple regimes of this graph. So anything below 99% is basically, so this is gate fidelity. It's basically impossible to build a real physical quantum processor. It's just impossible to do error correction. Um, and so it's game over. In this regime, so between 99% and 99.9%, it's technically possible to build a quantum computer. But for every single qubit, you would need like a million error correcting qubits. So in practice, this is impossible. Um, but above 99.9%, then we're getting to the regime where we can actually do some interesting things. Now, the fidelity isn't just what matters, also the speed. If I have a, a processor with one hertz, then I may struggle to get any improvement on some of the things I could do classically. So uh, this is the typical speed of the best iron gates. So this is a few hundred microseconds. The superconducting qubits are much faster on the order of nanoseconds, tens of nanoseconds. Silicon quantum dots, again, hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, this is some of the work which um, I'm building upon. So this is on the order of a few milliseconds, just using microwaves, no lasers involved. And then this is another fast gate. So this is doing something similar to these gates, taking it down from 100 microseconds down to a few microseconds. Um, and so all of these experiments here are done with two ions um, in a trap, in a single trap. Uh, and they're separated by a few microns. But what we've also been working on in Oxford is doing quantum uh, gates and quantum entanglement between two traps which are spatially separated. So we have an experiment which is uh, two iron traps separated by about a meter and we send photons between those two traps to entangle the ions. And at the moment we have a network entanglement fidelity of about 94% um, uh, between two ions which are spatially separated. And so this you know, can be used towards building up a, a network or a quantum processor or towards quantum internet, this, this sort of thing. So this is a, a kind of an idea of where we are in terms of um, you know, quantum error correction and what can we feasibly do. So on this axis is a number of operations you can perform. This is the error per gate. And this is effectively the number of qubits you have. So this is reasonably the state of the art. So in terms of single qubit operations, um, you know, we're well into this regime of having you know, 10 to the minus six error. And so we're kind of in, if you had, you know, increase the number of qubits, you could do single qubit operations into the error correcting uh, regime very, very easily. 
the problem comes when you try to do two qubit operations. So with two qubit operations, you need two qubits to interact. But in a, in a physical real world system, if two ions or two other uh, physical qubits are able to interact, chances are they're probably able to interact with their environment. And that's what makes it difficult um, to make very, very high fidelity two qubit gates. Now the best two qubit gates at the moment, about 99.9%, .9%, so we're sitting on the kind of verge of, of this error correcting mountain. Um, and actually, you talked about Chris Monroe giving a talk. He has a company called IonQ, and they uh, are building a quantum computer, which I think has an average two qubit fidelity of about 99.7, uh, but they're scaling up to about 100 qubits. So they start moving up this quantum error correcting mountain here. So that's the kind of where we want to be. So we want to be up in this plateau. Um, but now I'll talk about how you actually use trapped ions as a qubit. So just going back to sort of you know, the first thing you maybe learn in terms of quantum information, quantum computing, um, with physical systems anyway, is a D DiVincenzo criteria. Um, so obviously, uh, the vast majority of you will probably already know this. Um, but you want to have something with a stable memory, something where you can initialize uh, the states of the system. You can um, create logic gates, a, a way to actually measure my qubits, and, and something where the, the gate speed is much, much faster than any sort of decoherent mechanism. So atoms, in our eyes anyway, are kind of nature's perfect qubits. So uh, atoms are all identical. So if I take a, a strontium atom from Brazil, or I take a strontium atom from England, as long as they're the same isotope, they're ex exactly identical, which is different to things like superconducting circuits or NV centers, where I have to actually physically manufacture those systems. And um, so with trapped ions, we're able to trap single ions, as, as you can see in this picture here. So this is a real picture using a CCD camera of a, of a single trapped ion. Um, and we can hold these trapped ions depending on the trap for days, or if you go to cryogenic operation, you can effectively hold ions in your trap indefinitely. So what's limiting in your trap is collisions of background gas. So this ion is trapped in, in a vacuum chamber. And if a background gas particle comes along and interacts with my ion, I get a collision and that can kick it out of the trap. So you have to build very, very good vacuum, but effectively we can trap single atoms and many uh, single atoms for as long as we want. So the easiest way to do this is to remove an electron, which is why they're trapped ions. Um, and then we stick them in a Powell trap. So this is, um, you may have seen before, but it's an RF electric field, which is effectively, there's these demonstrations which look like a rotating saddle. And you can create an effective 3D harmonic potential. Um, and so in this harmonic potential, you can use lasers to cool the ions, the ions motions down. So you imagine when they're initiating this potential, they've got a lot of kinetic energy. So we use lasers to cool them down. And eventually, if you cool them um, well enough, then they arrange themselves into an ordered crystal. So the reason they're linear in this way is because the trapping potential is a lot looser in this direction. So it's very tight in this direction, but loose in this direction. So they all align in, in a nice chain. And you can see that we can easily resolve these single ions. And so you can see now that I have a system where I can uh, call each one of these uh, a qubit. And if I can do individual addressing, I can clearly do readout because you can see them. Um, then we effectively have the basis for, for a quantum processor. So what do these ion traps look like? Well, I kind of showed you on the first slide a picture of a, of a trapped ion. But this is a macroscopic blade trap. So it's called a blade trap. It's got these kind of blade shaped uh, parts. And this is on the order, you know, it's macroscopic on the order of you know, centimeters. Uh, and more recently, people have been working towards building surface traps. Um, so this is a, a type of trap uh, we work with in Oxford as well. And you can imagine, you know, this sort of system is much more scalable. It's almost like a, a PCB for, for trapped ions and then buildings such large systems. So what does an ion look like in these potentials? So if I have a harmonic potential, then I effectively have a quantum harmonic oscillator. So I have a series of 
n harmonic emotional quantized levels. Now, because I also have my ion, which has its electron, uh, I also have spin states of that electron, so they can be atomic energy levels in the ion. So, for example, the what one state could be the ground s state, and one state could be the excited p states. Okay, so I have uh, a tensor product effectively with the motional state and the spin state, and I can drive carrier transitions where my electronic spin state changes, but my emotional state doesn't change, or I can drive red sideband transitions where my electronic state changes, but I remove emotional quantum energy. So I go from N to N minus one, or I can do blue sidebands, which go from N to N plus one. So the, the strength of the relative of these transitions depends on uh, what's called the Lamb-Dicke parameter. And the lamb dicke parameter is effectively the ratio of the wave packet size. So this is, if I have a particle in a trapped potential, it has a certain wave packet size. And this is the gradient of my applied uh, electromagnetic field. So you can kind of think of it as it's kind of the ratio of, you know, if I have a, a particle and I apply a field gradient across it, it feels some sort of motion. Okay, so the larger my gradient, the more I can shove my particle. And so for lasers, typically this is on the order of about 0.1. So how do we go about doing single qubit gates? So typically we define um, our qubits as just two energy levels within an ion. So it doesn't really matter what they are, but we can define them as zero and one here. Um, so they're typically defined uh, either in a hyperfine manifold, so between hyperfine states in, in the ground state, or on quadrupole transitions. And this is so that spontaneous emission doesn't give you loads of decoherence. Um, now, you can either, if, if we take the hyperfine qubit, for example, um, you can either drive this directly with microwave radiation. So this is, this is what I do. Um, or you can drive it with lasers using a, a Raman transition. Now, being able to control uh, the state of my electron between these two states is effectively a single qubit operation. Um, and if you've done uh, uh, any sort of atomic physics uh, courses, you'll know that if I apply radiation on here, if I have an idealized two level system, then I get rabbi flopping between my, my states. And if I, do, if I control how long I do a rabbi pulse for, then I can create uh, superpositions of uh, say zero. I can, if I do a pi by two pulse, I can create an equal superposition of, of zero and one. Um, and I can do a, a full sequence of single qubit gates, uh, as, ma as many as I want. And the, the axis of which I rotate around, so whether it's a, a sigma x gate or uh, around the x axis or y axis, all just depends on uh, the phase of the field which I'm applying. So it's very easy to apply these, these single qubit operations. And the errors on these, um, I, I won't go into this too much because uh, of regards time, but the important uh, data to take away from this graph is that single qubit operations are down in this 10 to the minus six level. So if you compare that to the quantum error correction uh, threshold, which is 99.9%, you know, well, we're down at the 99.999999% uh, in single qubit operations. So single qubits are kind of done uh, in, in theory. Um, and we can control, control that very, very well. So the hard part comes with two qubit gates, so conditional logic operations. I'm sorry, Ryan, Ryan, we're slightly like kind of reaching the limit. Okay. Do you still have much to tell? Uh, I can wrap it up in two minutes. Uh, three will be good. Okay, cool. So the, um, so the hard part of two qubit gates is making them talk to each other. And so the interaction between two electrons is, is very, very small. Um, because they're separated by microns, but the ion's mo motional um, interaction is large because of the Coulomb force. So if you have, have two ions, they can either move together or they can move apart. So what we can do is actually, if we create a, a state dependent force, depending on which way I can get my ion to move, then I can create a controlled uh, conditional operation. Um, and so the reason for this is that if I have my two ions in two separate spin states and they move in different directions in phase space, then they, this is kind of akin to a very phase. And as they move in phase space, they pick up an additional phase factor. 
So I can create a gate where if my two ions move in the same way, i.e. they're in the same spin state, nothing happens. Where if they're in different spin states, I can pick up a phase factor. And this way I can create a gate. Um, so we can, we can skip that. So just on the last sort of thing on, you know, how can we go about building a large scale processor? So there's two kind of main ideas. One is creating a sort of quantum CCD sort of thing. So this is using these 2D um, very thin uh, ion traps where you can shuttle ions around. As so you can imagine having multiple ions with multiple zones where you can do some operations. I can shuttle my ion around to store it and I can do some other operations here, here, here. Well, the other idea is to create very small nodes and do this quantum networking thing, which, which is what we're looking at in Oxford also. Um, so just a uh, final summary. So ions are really good for making qubits because they're all identical, long lifetimes, you don't have to reproduce them. Um, both single and two qubit gates have been uh, shown above the fault tolerant threshold, so we're kind of in, in a nice place. Um, and the, the, um, in the next sort of decades, uh, we're all looking at in terms of ion trap community is building these things into sort of hundreds to thousands of qubits. So it's a, it's a good time to be an ion trapper. So the, so the, this is a very old picture of the group, it's much larger now, um, but this is where we, we do most of our work. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was really cool. We have uh, one question. Oh, we have more questions. So the one was um, um, asked not in the question answer sessions, but in chat. So the question is, hi, was the gate set Clifford plus T, maybe when you were talking about the in the very beginning you were talking about yeah exactly so that's the original steam code so there's more um i haven't got it on here um but there's yeah so this so this uh, as you can see so this uh, quantum air correction mountain is the original sort of steam code so there are better ones now but this just gives you an idea of what you need to do and there is another question from anonymous user and the, he says uh, probably trivial. Can you explain what you mean by fast or slow gate speeds? Yes, yeah, so it's well. If if you imagine that your 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 computer right has, has gates, um, and your gate speed is gigahertz, then that means that you're doing nanosecond operations. And so, when we talk about gate speeds, it's how quickly can I perform a single operation? So in our case, if a single operation takes a millisecond. Well, then we have a kilohertz processing speed. Uh, and I have a question from myself. So do I imagine this right, that maybe first scalable quantum computer on iron traps will be kind of a huge barn, which has lots of traps with the fibers between them, and it will be not like nothing to have in common with some uh, small thing we can put in our pocket. Yeah, exactly. So, so I haven't got a picture here of the lab. Um, but you know, we have an optical table. Well, if, if you take this kind of networked idea, you know, this is two massive physical experiments uh, on, on, a, on a table, which is probably two meters by a meter. Um, and then around that is a lot of electronics and, and laser systems. The experiment I work on is a microwave gate. And the idea is to try and get rid of all of these laser systems, uh, but still the, the experiment lives in a vacuum chamber. Oh, gosh. Because you, know, you need to keep these trapped ions isolated from the environment. And we have maybe one last question from Sabayan Ruai Molik, although I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Mm -hmm. And he was the first who dared to raise his hand. So let's see how it works. Subayan, can you say something? Oh, uh, hi. Can you yeah, hear? Yes. Um, hi. Well, hi, Ryan. Thanks for the talk. I just have a wondering. So, uh, with the ion traps, do you expect to build QRAMs? So for, uh, and just to sort of make it explicit what QRAMs are for people who don't know about it. This is the notion of having quantumly accessible classical memory, where you say you want to make uh, queries or you sort of want to load the database perhaps in superposition, but you don't actually want large uh, quantum memories for them. Can, can, can we do that with iron traps is your question or yeah like what's the iron trap community how how do you feel about that is that the sort of thing you think is feasible yeah so the um so there's multiple approaches in terms of in terms of research 
so the, the research we try to do in Oxford is basically uh, how can we make the best two qubit gates possible and do this at a remote entanglement? Because um, that's one problem. There's no point having a scaled system if every individual one is rubbish. There's other people looking at how do we scale the system and, and deal with this. Um, so in terms of you know large algorithms and whatnot, then yeah, as long as people have single qubit addressability, which we do in iron traps because we can control the space in between them. Um, then having this kind of link between a classical and quantum uh, processor and a, a classical algorithm is, is definitely uh, what people are doing. I think people have used this as well for doing simulation of uh, ground states of molecules and things as well. Uh, I think QRAM is mostly used by people who have been talking about machine learning and other, other things. And this, for them, most of the times they say, here's a polynomial size quantum circuit, but uh, don't worry about loading the data. You just have a QRAM, so you load all your data from there. For example, that's one of the reasons why people got excited about Grover search for, like, load the data right. uh, from a classical register, and you just need log log many. Or I think, yes. Yeah, so so you, you can definitely do that on on an iron trap, because you can control the states where it's in every qubit you want. So you can initialize in the state you want. All right. Thanks. So, Ron, we have one more question for you in question and answer, question and answer session. So, yeah. I it would be great if you answer this uh, like written in written form, because I think it's time to. Uh, thank you very much for your talk once again. Yeah, for joining Sorry? us. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the third speaker of us is a uh, Clea Christiansson. I guess I hope at least I can uh, pronounce his name right. And he has something special to show us. He's a colleague of Augustine, and he also works in the uh, quantum theory group of Department of Computer Science. So clear. Oh yeah, here you are. Hello. Hi. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the introduction. So, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, quantum causal order. So can you see my uh, slides now? I can, I can, yeah. Appearing on the screen. Yeah. Good, okay. So, okay, so welcome to my talk. So in this, this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about quantum causal order. Classical uh, is fixed. So either we can have an event A and then an event B, or we could have uh, an event B followed by A. But we don't have kind of both of those orders happening at the same time. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about the possibilities arising in quantum theory for actually having a quantum superposition of both alternative orders. So can I just check that, uh, can you all hear me all right? I can hear. Um... Okay, good. So let's start with a plan. So, I'm going to start by talking about the difference between classical and quantum states, uh, then generalize this idea of, of, of kind of the difference between the states to the difference between classical order of events and the possibility of a superposition, a quantum superposition of orders. Uh, then I will talk about uh, applications of this uh, new idea to uh, quantum information processing and finally realizations in nature, uh, for example, in, in quantum gravi gravity and how that could actually be important in formulating a quantum theory of gravity. So the basic idea of, of classical physics, um, which I'll start with, now is that objects have, have well-defined states. So in, in classical physics, the world is, is, uh, is described by several different 
loads of different physical systems, and each physical system is assigned a state that describes how it is. So, for example, a two-dimensional classical system is, uh, for example, a coin, which can either have the state heads or the state tails. Uh, so now, and, and these are well-defined states. So you, you have either the heads or you have the tails. You don't have both at the same time. Now, we've heard from Augustan's talk what quantum theory is not about. So uh, now I'm going to give you an example of the way in which you, you can look at quantum mechanics, a kind of physics independent formulation where we are not kind of specifying whether we're doing mechanics or optics or anything else, but just kind of the, the generic structure of quantum mechanics. So I'm going to give a very, very simple um, kind of summary of one way to look at it, which is essentially that for the example of a two-dimensional coin in, in classical physics, we now generalize it to a sphere. So with our original heads and tails are now mapped to the north and south pole of this sphere. And instead of only being able to take these two definite values, we can now actually take any value in between, so any point on the globe. So for example, our location on this globe need not be the North Pole or the South Pole. It can actually um, be any, any uh, place on, on the globe. So I could be in Oxford, for example, like the little um, orange cross there. Uh, mathematically, this is described by, by vectors. So I take the North Pole as a basis vector and the South Pole as an orthogonal basis vector. And then any vector in the vector space is, is a linear combination of these two is also allowed. Uh, for example, uh, so mathematically, we use this uh, angular bracket notation. So the North Pole is assigned a, a bracket, a, a, a kind of vector, which is given by the N inside these brackets. The South Pole is given by an S inside the same brackets. And then Oxford is going to be some combination of those two vectors with complex number coefficients alpha and beta. So don't worry if you're not familiar with, uh, if you're not so um, confident with the, the linear algebra, because everything I say should be understood on a conceptual level in, in, in pictures. And those who are familiar with the mathematics at various different levels will kind of hopefully understand it um, to the kind of to the appropriate level. Now, there's a small catch uh, to the quantum systems. So if you remember the, the classical uh, systems, kind of two-dimensional classical coin is generalized to a, a, a sphere which has two antipodal points. Well, we cannot, we can, we're still constrained to asking the question about kind of opposite points. So I can ask if I'm at the North Pole or the South Pole, or if I'm in, for example, Rio de Janeiro or Tokyo, but I can't ask any arbitrary questions like, are you in Oxford or Cambridge? Because, I mean, and this, this constraint, I mean, uh, this constraint make sure that we cannot encode an infinite amount of information in this two-dimensional quantum system only. A simple uh, and understandable description of, of kind of the essence of, of quantum theory. Um, and now I want to, to show how this structure that of classical to quantum can be, can be generalized uh, actually in, in the case of, of orders of events. So in addition to having uh, classical states and, and quantum states, we now have a, we can look at classical order and quantum order. So classical order is, is quite simple. So imagine two agents, Alice and Bob, that can receive a message and then send a message once each. Well, Alice can, can take the message and send it to Bob, or um, we can also have the other way around where Bob takes in the message first and then sends it on to Alice. Or uh, of course, it's also possible that there's no really, there's no order. Simply Alice and Bob are just sitting there happily in their own uh, laboratories sending unrelated messages. Uh, note that loops are forbidden. So Alice, in this situation, Alice cannot send something to Bob who then ends up sending the same thing back to Bob again that he already sent. And this would violate really a fundamental, the fundamental principle of causality. Um, and essentially it amounts to time travel. 
So what happens in the quantum case? Well, you could imagine now a quantum superposition of, of both orders. So what was the quantum superposition of states we had before? Well, we had the quantum superposition of states just means that you add together two possible states and you find some state that's kind of in the middle on the sphere. Well, in this case, instead of North and South Pole, we have the order Alice and then Bob and the order Bob and then Alice, um, which are the pink and the blue trajectories respectively. So we can have a superposition where we have kind of add together the, the state corresponding to Alice and then Bob with, with the state Bob and then Alice, as you can see in this nice picture here. And note that causal loops are still forbidden. So the, in, in, in the, the picture we had, Alice and Bob um, still only act once each. So, so in both branches, there's only one Alice uh, and one Bob. So there is no kind of violation of causality. So there's no, no time travel or anything like that uh, going on. So let's get into some slightly more mathematical detail now. So the situation mathematically is described as follows. We start with a vector psi. So the Greek letter psi is um, inside here. You should be able to see the, the kind of angular brackets uh, and the Greek letter psi. So that, that, that's the vector that we start with. That's kind of is the information that Alice gets. And we consider the case where Alice and Bob are each allowed to perform operations known as unitaries. So unitaries are essentially operations that preserve the information and don't destroy it. So Alice can perform the unitary UA and Bob UB. And in a linear algebra, if the, the kind of the, the, the psi in the in the brackets is, is a vector, then UA and UB are matrices. And following linear algebra, we start we read from right to left. So we have psi, the order of Alice and then Bob. In the quantum case, we can have a superposition of alternative orders. So we have uh, the order psi followed by Alice and then followed by Bob, coupled with this pink trajectory, so the pink order, and that really describes the order. So the pink trajectory is kind of coupled with this state of the system that happens at the end, the state of the system that describes really what has happened to the message going from Alice and then Bob. And we combine that with the other possibility where we have psi and then UB, then UA, and that's coupled with the, the blue trajectory, which we, we call one. So one is kind of the state of this order and, and zero is the state of the other order. And we couple them together. So the little cross in the circle is called the tensor product. And that just is a mathematical way we represent combining two, two kinds of systems. So here, one system is the, the message and the other one is the order. Alpha and beta are just uh, complex coefficients. So as we had before, and we have linear combination of the two states. So hope that made uh, some sense at least. Um, now, let me just quickly go into some kind of applications of this. So you might be wondering that this kind of sounds uh, interesting, but maybe oh, I mean, what is the point? Well, the point is that superpositions of orders have proven advantages in, in various computational tasks. So with access to the possibility of, of taking two operations and, and performing them not one after the other, but in the superposition of, of one after the other and the other way around has been shown to, to enable kind of enable you to do computational tasks that uh, you cannot do with an ordinary sequential composition of, of the operations, as been shown in this seminal paper here. And moreover, it enables communication through communication channels that are completely noisy, as shown in this paper here, which um, is written by my supervisor, Giulio Kiribella and co-workers. So what happens is that, so let's imagine this situation here. Let's imagine a, a communication line between a sender and a receiver, where there are two communication lines and each communication line is, is completely noisy. So you can just model this line as a bin where the sender throws the message in the bin and the receiver has, a, has another message on their side that, and they just, 
they have another bin and they pick a random message out of the bin. So they just pick a random trash from the bin. So clearly in this case, you cannot transmit any information if you're just throwing your information away and the receiver picks some random stuff from, from the bin. But what we've they've shown in this paper is that if you have two such pairs of bins and you compose and you send your information in a superposition of orders through one pair of bins with the other pair, then this can actually, the combination of the, the, the noisy channels can actually filter out the noise. And the noise, the, the interference between the two orders actually cancels out the noise uh, that's been happening on the individual noisy channels. And this sounds kind of crazy, perhaps. But what has happened is that the information from the original message that was being sent has been transferred onto the state of the order itself. So if the receiver kind of has access somehow to the order, and they can retrieve the message, even though the message was completely destroyed itself. Now, a brief note for sense to you, but if you know about the density matrix formalism, uh, you might find it interesting to note that the state of the, if we start with the message psi, the state of psi actually appears on the off diagonal elements of the density matrix corresponding to the sort of the off diagonal elements of the order. So, so the, the, the information is now has been transferred to the off diagonal elements of this order uh, qubit. So it, it which really highlights the fact that it is the kind of quantum coherence between the two orders that preserves this information. Okay, so now uh, let's get back to, to reality and we can ask the question, are superpositions of causal orders actually found in nature or is it just some uh, random theoretical construct? Well, the honest answer is that right now we don't completely know for sure, but there are some indications uh, that suggest that indeed we can have superpositions of, of causal orders in nature uh, coming from general relativity, for example, example. So matter relates to space time in general relativity. So don't worry if you don't understand what's going on. The only thing that's important is that on the left hand side of the equation, we have these g's and they essentially represent space time. So, so they represent really the, the metric, the structure of space and time. And the right hand side is, is something stuff that represents matter. So masses or, or, or these kind of things. Now we know that matter fundamentally is quantum. So matter really is can be described by, by some quantum state. So if the right-hand side is described by a quantum state, then you know it, it's reasonable to suppose that if this equation holds, the, the left-hand side should also be described by a quantum state, which means that we have a quantum state of space-time. Now, how does that work? Well, we can imagine that a mass that can be in two locations. So the mass could be in this pink location, or it could be in the uh, blue location. Now. If it's in the blue location, it'll, it'll induce this blue space time that I've drawn here with, with these uh, blue uh, blue squiggles and the, the pink space time of the mass. So we, we call the pink space time zero and the blue space time one. Now, of course, we could put the mass in a superposition of both space times. So it is both in, in the pink and the, sorry, we could put the mass in the superposition of, of the configurations pink and, and blue which induces a space time then that is in the superposition of the two configurations. And this is described by the state I written at the bottom. So you have a, a pink mass and the, together with the pink zero space time and the, the blue mass with the blue space time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you have two different space times, you can see that they might induce an evolution through the two agents, Alan and Bob in the opposite order. So this one space time could curve Pink space time could curve, you know, Alice first to Alice, then to Bob, whilst the, the other one curves first through Bob and then Alice. And so uh, this superposition of masses could induce a superposition of space time that then induces indeed a superposition of orders of operations. So with that, um, I am going to uh, conclude my talk. And if you're interested in knowing more about 
causal orders, uh, space time, and um, quantum information, then please follow our collaboration, QISS.fr, which is a big international collaboration between um, my group, the quantum group in Oxford, and our recently established joint center in, in Oxford and the University of Hong Kong, uh, together with many other research groups in quantum gravity and quantum information um, around the world. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Claire. It was yeah, bright and interesting. We have uh, two questions and I also have some questions. So the first question is, did you read all, did you read all those books behind you? from the anonymous <laughs> user <laughs> so uh, uh <laughs> good question uh <laughs> i haven't read all the books no they 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 belong to to my parents actually so i haven't uh, i haven't read them all <laughs> okay another question from johannes van Kauser. can superpositions of causal oh, hi, johannes ah so okay maybe you can just answer to your friend so can superpositions of causal orders be reduced to ordinary superpositions in quantum mechanics and if not what's the distinguishing feature Okay, so that's a that's a very good question. Um, so, so I suppose uh, that depends uh, depends what you mean exactly. So I mean, in a sense, in a sense, uh, if you write, if you have written the the superposition, if you've written the the state of the order of the system as as just another quantum state, then I guess you could you could think of it that way, but that's not really um, the point. So the, the point here is that typically that we think of this. So so clearly, once you have the once you have the two orders. So if you send some message through system, is just a quantum system. Now. But the point of, of this, the point we're actually interested in is the kind of the whole operation that takes two, takes two operations and superposes the orders of the operations. So it, it's kind of a higher order operation. So the stuff we are interested in is really the, the operation of taking the two events and putting them together in, in this superposition of order. So it's a bit like, uh, let, let's say, I want to eat a sandwich, so I can I can go to um, Subway and buy a sandwich or, or to Tesco, but uh, there are like two slices of bread and I, I have some cheese and I put them together. That's the operation that I'm interested in. So that's the, the superposition of orders is really the, the the kind of the putting together of the bread and the cheese, uh, which is interesting. The the, the operation of, of doing this um, is something that is not really seen in, in in standard quantum mechanics uh, whereas of course the the output of this operation i.e the, the the sandwich is is described by standard quantum mechanics and i also have a question so when you was talking about these two channels which are noisy and you can like save some information yeah is it under the assumption of some special noise or just any noise which makes your uh, channel useless so in this case, it was just a, a completely general um, kind of uh, noise model. So we haven't assumed where it's coming from. So let's go back to the bin um, example. Uh, so what we just assume is that the noise, so if you have some message, whatever, whatever system the message is encoded in, the state of that system becomes completely noisy. So imagine like if my the state of my system was um, like an atom with, or let's say a photon with, with polarization, a given polarization, then the bin just randomizes the polarization. So let's say I had a horizontally um, polarized photon, then the bin would make a random combination of the uh, random combination of horizontal and, and vertical polarization. And the last question, let it be for today. What is the weirdest yeah. thing that we could physically do if we had high control over creating quantum causal orders, e.g. Mm. in large or microscopic objects? So like like Schrodinger quet, but with causal orders. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great question. 
what's the weirdest thing that we can do? Um, oh, uh, it's the weirdest thing. Well, I, th I think it's quite a kind of an exercise, <laughs> not a question to a speaker. So like, yes, I mean, I, I don't really know. Actually, I don't know. Maybe Augustan, Augustan also uh, works on, on some stuff like this. Maybe, maybe Augustan has an idea. <laughs> So I think anybody can, I mean, I can have idea because I understood the concept as far as I can tell. Yes, yeah, so, I, mean, yeah, I mean, anyone is feel, uh, yeah, please feel free to come up with ideas because I mean, we are very interested in, in coming up with new, new things that we could do. I mean, yeah. Uh, okay, last question from Nikki Lee, sorry. Uh, some technical question, I don't know the answer. Uh, can you read it? Yeah, so shouldn't we, hi Nikki, uh, uh, shouldn't we observe a mixed state since we can't really access the causal uh, antenna system? Uh, very good question, actually. Uh, that's, um, okay, so let's uh, go back to the, okay, where are we now? So, so let's find the picture, um, not here. So, The idea here is that the that we do the receiver actually does have access to the um, order system. So we assume the sender does not have access to the order system, but the the receiver does. So the receiver somehow should be able to measure the order. Uh, so now, if the if the receiver only measures the order in the kind of computational basis or the basis zero and one, where zero corresponds to the order Alice followed by Bob, or Bob one is Bob followed by Alice. If the receiver measures in this classical basis, which is the then the com, sorry the computational basis corresponding to these two classical possibilities, then uh, as you can see from this picture, that's the, sorry the equation. Then you lose the off-diagonal elements, and so then you will not um, achieve any communication advantages. But if the we, we have to assume that the receiver is somehow able to access this order system. Mm -hmm and do measurements in the Fourier basis or, or some other basis that is complementary to the basis uh, that kind of corresponds to the direct orders, Alice, Bob, or Bob, or Alice. So we really have to do, we really have to do some kind of quantum measurement on this order in order to, to uh, access the information. That's the answer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, I see. So I think we are done with our flash talks for today. Thanks once again, Hilaire. Thanks once again, uh, Augustine and Ryan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you everybody to, who was watching and who was asking the questions or who were just listening. It's still a great time. So as I have already said, we have other events during this term. We have a journal club next week. Uh, we'll have post some, uh, uh, we'll post some more information on our Facebook page uh, during the week, maybe closer to the weekend. Uh, share it, uh, join us, and I hope to see you soon in the term. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening and take care of yourself. And thanks to everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much for organizing. Oh, no. Bye bye. Bye bye. I'm stopping the translation. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Clap, clap, clap. Huge thanks. All right.